word in God where would we be without the truth that is contained in this book Lord that has withstood the test of time Lord it's been under a lot greater assault than even what we see today God throughout history and it has stood whole empires God have fallen whole uh, regimes Lord have fought against it God, whole kingdoms have tried to outlaw and get rid of your word, but Lord, your word stands and always will. That's why we gather together and open it up, Lord, because it's you that we look to, God, to feed us from your hand. Your Holy Spirit has been sent to teach us this word. And God, what a gift that is. Lord, this is like no other book or that we could read. This is alive and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword this is able to go right to my heart right to soul and spirit and do that work that we desire lord it hurts sometimes but god it, it hurts good and it's a great feeling lord to know that my savior my god is speaking to me on a level that no human being ever could so father please open your word to us and feed us tonight we ask from Je in jesus name amen Chapter 10, verse 1, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, called with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer, and in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, chapter 10, we arrive at the middle of the tribulation period, three and a half years into this seven-year time period. Up until this point, the tribulation has consisted of a series of seven sealed judgments, with the seventh seal opening a series of seven trumpet judgments, which as we saw, an angel would step forward, he would announce each judgment one after another through the blowing of a trumpet. Then the judgment would fall, and with chapter 9, the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments were unleashed, and a demonic invasion came upon the earth. Now, what you see in these judgments, as you study this, is how much of the judgment that comes upon the earth is God just allowing humanity to experience the full extent of the sin that they desire, that they dabble in right now and enjoy. And some people would think it's mean of God to judge the earth when all he's doing is allowing those who refuse his gracious offer of peace that's been extended through the gospel of Jesus Christ just allows humanity to experience the full measure of their desire. In some warped way, you'd think they would be thankful. They just want it all, dude. I mean, if you've got little kids and they whine and complain because they can't have candy and soda every single day, and you're mean, mommy and daddy, because you make me eat broccoli and nutritious food. Well, all right, you have it your way. Here's a 50-pound sack of Skittles and unlimited root beer, man, and nothing else. That's what you want. That's what you desire. And, oh, mom, you're the best mommy and daddy ever <laughs> any young kid could ever had until about the third day or so. And the things they thought were so good start getting sickening. But hey, man, that's what you want. Have at it. Have the full measure of it. That's what the tribulation period is meant to do. Wake up as many people as possible to how gracious God is and how sin is not all that it promotes itself to be. Even though 
but even then, people will still be so hardened in their sin and in rebellion against God that even after three quarters of the earth's population has been killed, you see at the end of chapter 9, verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. All God does is say, in essence, you want to save the planet? You want to make that your God? You want to heal the environment without me? God's saying, okay, here, I will leave you all alone. I will remove my grace and see how successful you are from protecting the planet from a meteor shower or earthquakes that are uncontrollable, wildfires. You have at it. Let's see you control it all. They can't worship science. That's what people want to do. Well, science is going to save us. I say, fine, let science save you from a meteor coming. Who do you think blocks these things? And right now, there's way over a hundred video games that let people interact with demons. There's been close to 150 movies just in the last couple decades that have demonic plots with them. People can play a video game and be a demon. Very popular subject. People can pay money and munch their popcorn and watch demons there on the screen. Keanu Reeves, you know, is fighting demons. Oh, dude, this is so cool. <laughs> How awesome. You want to worship demons? God says, all right, here. I'll unleash the real thing. And you interact with that. You think they're so playful. <laughs> no. All moral restraint, all personal accountability is removed. Imagine that. Materialism, sexual morality, violent behavior, drug use, it's all allowed to fill the planet as much as you want. All in an attempt to jar people to their senses. This is how merciful God is. When you study his judgments here in the Bible, God loves humanity so much. It's like in the time leading up to the tribulation period, Jesus said the world's going to undergo what he called birth pains of war and violence, demonic deception, diseases, earthquakes, famines. Those things are going to grow. They're going to grow. And he told, if you're watching, understand that this is how it's going to be. And man, if you, those things are not increasing now, I don't know how much more they can increase, but it is all in an attempt to make people, you know, to wake them up to the approach of God's judgment that is coming. It's these birth pains are going through the roof. After the rapture of the church, when the time of God's judgment comes, even then it's going to be a progression we've seen. Extremely amplified, man, the, the cataclysms and things. But when that comes, it's not just going to be guys and go, bam, and you're done. You know, he's still, if there is one soul left. Now, we saw Wednesday how David is praying to the God of hosts. And I described how, you know, that term, you find it 270 some times in the Old Testament. This title of the, the, the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabaoth. The Lord of hosts, it means a, a being, a, a divine being who has control of innumerable populations of created beings. One of which just happens to be redeemed humanity. But we saw last week in chapter 9 and 10, he has a whole population of demons that he could have just wiped out. He could have not let them exist at all. But he is keeping them, as Jude says in Second Peter says, he's keeping them preserved for his use so that he can allow them to just come forth during the tribulation period even if one soul will be saved from that. Think of that. God could wipe them out, but he uses evil for his eternal good. And, you know, he's allowing a whole population, as we saw last week, it's, it's horrible sounding. 
But he says, fine, you want to rebel? You're out of heaven. I will reserve you. I will let you come upon this world in rebellion to me because maybe if they see you and you torment them enough, maybe one human being will repent. How valuable is a human soul when you think of that? That God will go through all of this. You know, the book of Ephesians says, as the bride, as, as the Lord's redeemed bride, we have been raised above all creation, seated in the heavenlies. You study that passage and look what it means to be the Lord's bride and remember that next time you're tempted to just go and, and do something you shouldn't be doing. This is what the Lord sees. He loves us anyway. Thank you. His grace is poured out upon us. But this in the tribulation period, now the church is gone. He's still redeeming human beings. And as we saw where the, you know, certain groups of redeemed human beings will serve in different places during the kingdom age. But the church, us, who are sitting here right now in, in defiance of whatever the world says, he says, that's my bride. They don't care what the world says. They serve me and Lord Jesus. We can't wait until you call us home. But until then, he's purging his bride. Where are the other Christians, man? Christians should be filling churches right now. They're afraid of something, I guess. What are you afraid of? Perfect love casts out fear. You're not afraid of to die. I'll be set free to be with my Lord. I'm not going to be irresponsible. But at the same night, time, I'm not going to deny my Lord. The first three and a half years of the tribulation period will culminate in demonic judgment that we saw in the last chapter. But there's one trumpet judgment left. It'll come at the end of chapter 11. And the sounding of that trumpet will unleash all the concluding judgments leading to the Lord's return and the establishing of his messianic kingdom here on the earth. But here in chapter 10, before the final trumpet is sounded, there's a temporary suspension in the judgments coming from heaven, an amazing God's merciful grace. John says there in verse 1, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven. Now, the reference to another mighty angel is speaking of a second angel like the one which was seen at the beginning of these judgments, chapter 5, verse 2, where John saw a strong angel, it's the same Greek word, proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose the seals? Here we'll see that this mighty angel... Again, this strong angel, this, this angel is in, introducing a writing of some sort as well. The language used is presenting this angel as appearing on the earth. It's going to be dramatic things going on during the tribulation period. Coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud, it says. Coming in a cloud like this is an emblem in the Bible from Mount Sinai to the return of Jesus Christ of divine judgment, divine power, yet coming, it says, with a rainbow on his head. That would be symbolic of divine peace, as was seen after the flood and in other places in Scripture where references made in prophecy or poetic books to rainbow. This angel has the, a face like the sun and feet like pillars of fire. An appearance of this angelic being, very striking, you know, to say the least. But it is meant to show here that he is coming with divine authority. This is not God, but he has the authority of God coming to the earth. Because the appearance of this mighty angel introduces the middle of the tribulation and the final judgments because that is what is going on right here. It's been seen by many as this being a dramatic display of God's final attempt to say, this is, this is the end of it before the culmination of his judgment comes. As we'll see if what this angel represents and says and does here, what goes on, it, you'll see that this is God saying, 
This is the last call. Now, you got to remember, the people on earth at that time, unless they're studying the book of Revelation, which doesn't seem likely, they're going to be caught up in sexual morality and drugs and thefts and violence and worshiping demons. But they want... They won't know that a transition is taking place from the first half of the tribulation to the final events. They won't even know they are in the seven-year tribulation period. I don't know about you, before I got saved, I didn't know what was going on in the world. I knew what was going on in my world from my own selfish person, but I didn't know what was going on from a biblical perspective. I, I could care less. Israel has been a nation the whole time I have been alive. It wasn't until I was born again, started reading this Bible, that I realized the significance of that. I didn't care before that. All I cared about was partying and having a good time and doing my own thing. I could care less. Someone came around with the Bible. I said, get out of here. It's not going to be front page news. Like, oh, look, we've reached the middle of the tribulation period. Look at that, honey. Wow, I guess it's, this is it. People are just going to assume, as they do today, that if we just get past this crisis, things will get back to normal. Maybe after this demonic attack thing settles down, you know, we can take on that second mortgage. It's, dude, ima imagine the fake news in that day. Imagine when people are going to be believing you know, fake news times a thousand. We're going to see in a couple chapters that Satan himself is going to be allowed full reign at this point. You think he's going to be telling people, the end is coming. He's going to tell them just the opposite, man. Don't worry about it. Dude. Just party. Well, here comes this formal announcement from God at the end. A mighty angel. A rainbow on his head. His face like the sun. His feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book opened in his hand. Now, it's interesting here. John's attention is drawn to this little book the angel, that this angel is holding, just as his attention was drawn to the scroll in chapter 5. All his activity, and he saw this scroll there. The Greek word for little book here is a different Greek word than the one used for scroll that Jesus took in chapter 5. So this is something totally different. The fact that verse 2 says it was open means all the information contained in it is observable to everybody. What the little book represents is interpreted by different people in different ways, but most believe, due to the symbolism surrounding this, that it represents none other than this book right here. That all the information included in this incredible piece of literature authored by God himself, the picture here is that the full revelation of God's word has come to pass. With the final judgments now that are revealed in Scripture, that they've been revealed multiple times. We've studied Old Testament prophecy. These Scriptures, none of this is new, as I'll show you in a moment. The whole word of God is proclaimed in advance for thousands of years, will have come to fulfillment exactly as God said it would. When it says he set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, in verse 2, he's taking a stance that represents complete authority over the entire earth, land, and sea. And verse 3 says he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. He cried out seven thunders out of their voices. The verb cried is a Greek word that speaks of an intimidating, frightening roar like a lion it goes forth in power and loudness. I don't know if you've ever heard a lion roar apart from the beginning of a movie. We were in a zoo in Omaha once, and there was a lion around the corner. When it roared, everybody froze. It was an incredible sound. It was just like, whoa, everyone just was like, what is that? That's how a lion catches its prey. It just roars and everything frees and it just eats it. It is very intimidating. Now, there's an Old Testament prophecy that relates to this in Jeremiah chapter 25. So let's turn there. Jeremiah chapter 25.
We're going back to the Old Testament, a glimpse of God's future judgment upon the whole earth is given to his people at that time, the children of Israel. And as you see this, we've seen this other times, but a, a glimpse of what God's bringing to the whole earth is given to the children of Israel in an attempt to cause them, as biblical prophecy is meant to do for us, to put my present situations in proper perspective. Dude, the Lord is going to judge the earth. It's all going to burn. In Jeremiah's time, God was bringing judgment upon his people Israel for their sins so as to cause them to turn to him, which as is seen in the prophecy given here in Jeremiah 25, God wasn't judging Israel because he wanted to spoil all their earthly fun as they viewed their sin. But he was seeking to get them to see that this world itself is one day going to be judged. It's only temporary. God didn't create this planet as a place for wicked people to exist in rebellion to him. That's how a lot of people seem to think that. God just created this planet so people can mock him and just fornicate and do whatever they want to do. God's saying, that's not what I created this for. But see, he created it in order to redeem people who choose redemption. And in order for that, God has allowed sin and evil for, to exist just for a certain amount of time, but not forever. And that's what he always points out, as you see in the Old Testament. He didn't allow his chosen people, Israel, to just continue in their sin. You see it in verse 29 of Jeremiah 25. He's, he's chastising them for their sins. And he says in verse 29, For behold, I begin literally by bringing calamity on the city which is called by my name. It's another way of saying judgment begins at the house of God. 1 Peter 4.17 You shall not be unpunished, for I will call it for a sword on all the inhabitants of the earth, says the Lord of hosts. There he is again, Jehovah Sabaoth. Therefore prophesy against them all these words and say to them, The Lord will roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He will roar mightily against his fold. He will give a shout as those who tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. So the whole population of humanity, a noise will come to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead his case with all flesh. He will give those who are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, disaster shall go forth from nation to nation. A raised whirlwind shall be raised up from the farthest parts of the earth. And at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. Wail, shepherds, and cry. Roll about in the ashes, you leaders of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and your dispersions are, are fulfilled, you shall fall like a precious vessel. And the shepherds will have no way to flee, nor the leaders of the flock to escape. A voice of the cry of shepherds, a wailing of the leaders to the flock will be heard. For the Lord has plundered their pasture, and the peaceful dwellings are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He has left his lair like the lion. For his land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. So God interjects here in his, in his rebuke of his people to say, look it, you're going to get judged temporarily on this earth. They were taken into Babylonian captivity, but he reminds them his judgment is going to come upon the whole earth. The whole earth will be judged at one point. You can say, well, that's pretty mean of God. Think about this. He's, we're, you turn back to Revelation, and you realize this is written 2,500 years ago. How much merciful can God be? He tells you over and over, this is what's coming. He tells it all the way back from to the time of Moses. I'm going to judge the earth. You have an opportunity to be redeemed and be saved out of it. When Jesus was on the earth, he, he told Nicodemus, he said, the, the Father didn't send his Son into the earth to condemn the world. He sent him to save the world. 
you read the Bible, the world's condemned. It is going to be judged. Jesus, I didn't come to condemn you. I hate to tell you, if you do not get saved, you're going to go down with what is spoken of here. So all the way back to the time of Jeremiah, God had given a prophetic glimpse of what we're seeing back in Revelation 10. This mighty angel coming to earth with a little book, roaring, it says in, in verse 3. Roaring, it cried with a loud voice as the lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Thunder in scripture, when used in a prophetic or poetic or symbolic sense, it's used many times to speak of the voice of God. Psalm 29.3 says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. You'll see that numerous times. These thunderous voices speak after this angel roars, this incredible scream. And the number seven, as we've seen in the, in the Bible, speaks of perfection or completeness. What these voices represent, again, has been interpreted in various ways, but the reality is nobody knows because John says in verse 4, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. So evidently, the words of the seven thunders voice were intelligible. John heard what they said because he was about to write it down, what he was hearing information-wise. Whatever he heard was not necessary for church-age saints to know. It was told to Moses, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, Deuteronomy 29.29, 29. but those things which have been revealed belong to us and to our children forever. God has revealed everything I need to know. He's revealed to every age what is needed to know in that age. If I am wise, I will learn that. I will know it, what he's revealed, and teach it to my children. There are other things that do not pertain to this present age. Not very much, pretty much just these thunderous voices here. Yeah, I can be assured that what has been revealed to me, including all of this book of Revelation, is important for me to know at this present time, or God would have said, seal that up. It's not for him to know. But see, there are aspects to this revelation even that are intended to be heard and understood only at that time, in the future when they occur. It probably wouldn't make sense to us. I probably wouldn't even know what it is, but it only bring confusion. When it is heard in that day, it will make perfect sense. You can be sure of that. And it will provide the exact intention for which uh, they, these words were spoken to the people remaining on the earth at that time. So the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth, the things that are in it, the sea, the things that are in it, that there would be delay no longer, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, the seventh trumpet, he's about to sound the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. So whatever was proclaimed by the seven thunderous voices that is sealed by a solemn oath, liter literally, this mighty angel raised his right hand, is what it's saying in verse 5. So it's interesting, he has his little book and he raises his hands at his right hand to swear an oath, just as people do with the Bible when they're swearing into office or some other oath right now. It's the same picture. The oath sworn here is by him who lives forever and ever. In other words, by the eternal God who lives apart from time altogether. He created time in a totally separate realm. He can inter interact with it, but he dwells outside of time. He can interact with Adam and with the book of Revelation at the same time from his perspective. Verse 6 describes him as creator of this entire physical universe. 
created heaven, he created earth, created the sea, and all the life forms in them. The word delay is chronos in Greek. It's translated time in almost every other place in the New Testament. So literally the message is time's up. The world, in all its hardened rebellion against God, is being told, you run out of time. The time's up. A message that is being sworn on an oath. <laughs> Did you think of the patience of God? He extends such mercy to fallen humanity. The people at that day probably are going, oh, that was a cool thing. Wow, dude, I was tripping. I saw this angel. Man, it was incredible. They extend such mercy when the seventh trumpet sounds, verse 7 says, you know, it's, it's, it still provides time. That's how merciful God is. It says in the days of his sounding. It's plural. So it's not when it sounds, bam, you're done, but in the days of his sounding. We're going to see the seventh trumpet unleashes seven final bowl judgments. And God is merciful all the way down the line. But at that point, the mystery of God, verse 7 says, as he declared to his servants the prophets, here in the Bible, will be finished. So this unfolding progressive revelation we know as the Bible will come to completion with the sounding of the final trumpet. The only thing the people on the earth at that time will have revealed to them is what, what we don't have already here will be the understanding of these thunderous voices, but they'll have everything just as we do. But it, it says, apart from that, we can glimpse into their future through prophetic books like this with pretty amazing accuracy of what's going to be taking place. Here, John, as a time traveler, as we view him here at a time yet future to us, you know, a guy who lived 2,000 years ago, you know, reading what he saw future to us, he is told to do something very interesting at this point in verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, I ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I'd eaten it, my stomach became bitter. John is told to do the same thing every one of us is told to do. You consume the Word of God. Literally devour this. Is that how I interact with this book? Do I devour it? Do I consume it? Or do I just uh, pick and choose whatever? Is it like that? Or is it like brand new? This comes as a direct divine command, not from the mighty angel, but the voice I heard from heaven spoke to me. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God, is how Jesus put it in Matthew chapter 4. Ezekiel the prophet is given the same command in Ezekiel chapter 3. Take the little book which is open, verse 8 says. It's all been open to your understanding. Referring once again to the fact that God's full revelation has been given to anyone who desires to take and eat it, verse 9 says. That's the purpose that God's word has come to humanity for, to be ingested, to be internalized spiritually. His word filling my heart the way physical food fills up my stomach. Yeah, I remember there was a commercial years ago of some FedEx guy. He showed up at some lady's door. He looked like he just got off of a, a deserted island. He comes to deliver this package that he tells the lady receiving it how I spent five years like all this. I was a castaway on this uh, undiscovered island. I kept your package for you know, this whole time until I was finally discovered, and here it is. I bring it to you, and the lady's like, oh, gee, thank you very much. And he's looking at the package. He's looking at her. She's about to close the door, and the guy is just out of curiosity. 
What is it you're, that I was guarding this whole time on this deserted island? She opens it up. She says, oh, nothing really, just a satellite phone and some GPS tracking device and a compass and water purifier and some seeds. Everything he could have used while stranded on a desert, deserted island. You wonder how many people own one of these? You know, I was on the on the biblical insights today and talking with other pastors and talking between on the commercials and everything and just how all these Christians, man, they're calling up this one pastor saying, man, they can't sleep at night because of the election. Because everything's going wrong. Everything's all bad. I said, I'm sleeping just fine. I don't know. Maybe I'm supposed to be upset or something. I mean, it's a bummer. I, you know, it doesn't look real good for this country. But I don't belong to this country. My king is in heaven. I mean, I don't want to just live in, in a, you know, a bad place. But I'm not losing sleep. I have total peace and joy in Jesus Christ. I have oh, throughout the years, my whole time, man. If, if a, a politician does not get elected and that destroys people's faith to where they're walking away from their faith and they can't sleep at night, then that's probably a really good thing to happen to them. To wake them up and say, dude, what are you trusting in? And you devour this book, man, whatever, man. <laughs> Have at it. You people want to fight over a planet that's going to burn up? Go for it. You know, I grew up on a farm, and I shared before, you know, we, we had beef cattle, and out in back of the, of the barn, my dad had this huge manure pile, and me and my brothers would fight on it and throw each other off and play king of the manure pile. <laughs> Dude, that's all you can have if you want to run the world. You're king of the manure pile, man. <laughs> Have at it. You won. All right. You did it, man. You get it all. You know, God's going to send one meteor and go, there you go. You think you're, you're not in control of anything. I know a lot of Christians, man, who own one of these, but they never open it or barely ever, and they're freaked out, and they're bummed out. Why? You're still going to heaven, right? Well, yeah, but then what's the problem? Everything I need to sustain me here on earth, right here, God says, eat it up. When eaten, though, God's word, especially his prophetic word, it is bittersweet, verse 9 says. Sweet as honey in the mouth. Bible prophecy, a very popular subject. Let's face it. If I was teaching Leviticus, it would probably be half of us here tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'd be there next time, dude. You know, let's go through the, how many unclean animals can I eat, you know? <laughs> yeah, very popular, very intriguing. There's something very edifying about studying the coming apocalypse because as a believer, I want God's kingdom to come to this earth. I pray for it every day, especially as the world gets more and more vile. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And oh, remind me again. I go to it again. I look Isaiah 34. I go to Isaiah 24. I go to Revelation. Guess what, Jeff? It's still going to burn up. It's still going to burn. You can, you know, be afraid of losing something, but you're not losing anything. And as exciting as the subject can be, there's a bitter side to it also because the reality exists of the actual judgments, and I love people here who are not saved, and it's going to be awful, and they think that I'm crazy, and they think they're going to just have this whole ball of fun, especially when we stamp out Christianity or you people, and we get our way, it's going to be all kinds of fun, like Satan's just setting people up to have pleasure crews. He's setting people up to torment them, man. <laughs> you don't even realize that. The gospel itself is sweet to those who are saved, but it, when it's rejected, it is bitter. There's a sweetness to consuming the word of God as well. It just, it's just so edifying as you read it and study it. It transforms my life, but that transformation in my life is not appreciated by an unbelieving world, and more and more they hate it. They don't want, you know flaming Christians walking around telling them the world's going to blow up and you got to get saved. That ruins their fun. 
If I really live what the Bible teaches, I'm not going to fit in with this world that doesn't. That contrast is good. It's a good thing. Dude, there's been so many Christians for too many years who fit in with the world. If the world just welcomes them and the world comes to their church, doesn't feel convicted at all. You go through the Bible and you don't skip around. You go right through it. It's amazing how many times I have taught you a passage of Scripture and somebody invited their mom or their friend, finally came to church, and you had to be teaching on homosexuality or you had to be teaching on living or with your girlfriend, and I finally got them here. And they get up and storm out. Well, that's probably the one thing they needed to hear. Like, I set it all up, dude, for your, your sister, you know, who's a lesbian, and I told her, you know. It's like, no, dude, we just happened to be there. Guess what? God is a very uh, a mighty God. And I can't help it we were in Romans 1 or we were in Ephesians 5 or 1 Corinthians 6 when your unsaved relative was here. I'm not going to cater to them. I'm going to tell them the truth, and so should you if you love them. You know, tell them people who fornicate will not go to heaven. I hate to tell you, you can read it in multiple pages. Oh, that's so mean. Well, take it up with the author, dude. I'm just the, the FedEx guy bringing the message. There's a bitter sweetness to it. When you live for the word, it's just sweet, dude. It's like, oh, thank you, God, for the freedom. But you tell the people they don't like to hear it. And John himself would find that out. Guy only got banished to an island after getting boiled in oil. But God kept him around, as it says in verse 10. He says, I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. You must prophesy again, verse 11 says. The word prophesy is used in the general sense in this verse. It just You're, you're going to make divine truth known to others. When you tell people the scripture, when you tell them the word of God, and, you know, you are prophesying. You are giving forth the word of God. So don't sugarcoat it. Don't compromise it. Don't, you don't have to be mean. You don't have to get in someone's face. But, you know, if somebody asks, which is when I'm to speak, when I am asked a question, I'm to be ready always to give an answer for the hope and not to just go out and start preaching at people. But if I am living in a way and if I am prepared... I can guarantee you, you will have people questioning you. God will move heaven and earth to bring them and seat them in a sanctuary if you are willing to tell the truth. And he'll do the same thing in your life. If you're willing to tell the truth without compromise, live it so you're not a hypocrite. God will move heaven and earth to bring one person. That's, we're seeing that right here. The most hardened of hearts, he's trying to reach them. There's some guys debating about what's the best Bible translation. One guy said, oh, King James, of course, man, the eloquent language. I just love the King James version. Oh, no, some other guy said the NASB is closer to the original manuscripts. Oh, no, I like the NIV. Some the other guy said it's easier to read. Then they asked their fourth guy, you know, what's, what's your best, your favorite Bible translation? The best translation of the Bible I ever read was the one my dad lived in my house. That's the most effective way to make divine truth known. Just live it out. You want to give a great apologetic for Christianity? Live it. That is, that's all I have to do. He doesn't tell me to be a theologian. He just says, just obey my word. And he will put me in places where people will have to deal with my presence. It's the most effective way to make divine truth known. Just live in people. You make people uncomfortable. Most unbelievers, you know, you hate to tell people, they don't know what a King James is or an NASB or NIV anyway. They do know what I live for as a Christian. And that's the idea here, that by feeding on the Word of God, I will become a vessel for communicating that word. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, Hebrews 5 says. 
but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who, uh, by reason of use or practice, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The Word of God, if it's just milk to me, I'm going to be unskilled in the Word of Righteousness. But if I am doing it, if I'm practicing it, it will be solid food and I will grow up and by reason of age, I will have my senses exercised to discern good and evil. John is told here in verse 11, you must prophesy again among, literally, or before many people, nations, tongues, and kings. But wait, God, I'm sitting on, an, on a deserted island here called Patmos. What are you talking about? Amazingly, no other book has been translated into more languages and gone into more parts of the world than John's writing that are included in this book. Over 5 million Bibles are printed every year in over 18,000 languages and distributed. Quite a fulfillment of what God says here. John, you eat this up because you're going to bear witness to billions of people. So uh, chapter 10 is not just an introduction, but John is commissioned for the second part of this vision that he's given now. And you and I have been given the same commission in getting God's word out to as many people as possible. And the commission is, eat this book, and you will become a vessel that God can use. Let's pray we continue to have the freedom to do so. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for feeding us your word, God. Only your Holy Spirit can do that. No, no man, no person can do that. Your Holy Spirit feeds our soul. Cause us to walk in it, God, that we can grow in it, Lord, that we can be a light, Lord, especially the days we're in. Maybe it will get tough. It's, I don't know, it's always been tough for me. Maybe it will get tougher. I don't know. I don't want to minimalize anything, God. But, Lord, I don't want to minimalize your power and the power of the cross that has set us free either just because the world looks big and bad. Compared to you, Lord Jesus, you, you died for the sins of everybody. The people out there are not our enemy. They are our mission field. Satan is our enemy. If we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the principalities and powers. We don't wrestle against Democrats. We don't wrestle against liberals and progressives. Those are our mission field. Those are people we got to be preaching the gospel, or at least living the gospel out, because they're lost, just like we were. They're not going to find fulfillment and satisfaction, just like we didn't. But if they see people who do, they'll know at least where to go when they're looking for the answer. So, God, we can't do that apart from you. We can't do it apart from your word, and so strengthen us and and cause us to live and be bold for your glory, Lord Jesus, because you alone are worthy. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.